Thank you everyone for being here early. I know the first slot of the day can always be contentious. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of fun. I'm gonna look at how I repaired my oven using some different tools than you probably would consider for your sort of typical oven repair stuff. Um, briefly about me, so I've done a lot of work on embedded design as well as then um, hardware security. So I co-authored a book with Jasper called the Hardware Hacking Handbook, which goes through actually some of the attacks I'm talking about today, power analysis and fault injection. Um, and as they said, right after this at the bookstore, which is on this level, over to the left a bunch and then to the left again, um, I'm gonna be doing a book signing so you can make your copy unsellable in the future. Um, I started the Chip Whisperer project, which actually does power analysis fault injection, and now it's part of uh, Low Risk CIC, which is a UK, uh, similar to a nonprofit, a community interest company in the UK that also manages some other important open source security projects, including the Open Titan project um, and a open source RISC V core IBEX. Um, and I'm in Halifax, Canada, where I'm also adjunct professor at the university there. All right, so enough about that. What's this talk about? This talk involves um, Canadian Thanksgiving, which is a few weeks before American Thanksgiving, although the general idea is the same. You have a bunch of food. Um, normally, you cook a large turkey, um, and that turkey takes several hours to cook. Uh, because one year, though, it took too long, it sort of, you know, you end up with, oh, no, this is not done. This is going to be another hour or two. What's going on? Um, we switched to cooking ham, contentious, contentious point of order, I know. Um, but the, the issue is we had some guests that would not accept our delay reason of being the oven was not at the right temperature, um, and they became very disgruntled with this delay. Um, so yeah, so then it was this question of the oven, and I kind of forgot about it until another Halifax area man had a similar oven issue, and by similar, I mean his caught fire, but, I mean, you know, whatever, tomato, tomato thing. Um, and his, in this article, they actually mentioned this oven, similar to the one I had, the Samsung one, including this model, there was actually a class action lawsuit about it. Um, in the class action lawsuit, they allege that there's some temperature problem and it's, it's related to the temperature sensor, and this is causing the failures. And this would explain some of my failures, um, except it, it didn't quite seem like it, so if you've done, you know, embedded design stuff, you sort of realize what failures are gonna look like. And in this case, the oven, you know, if you restart it, it'll show you the correct temperature. So it doesn't feel like, you know, that's the root cause. It doesn't feel like the sensors just failed. There's a little more going on here. So my sort of theory was maybe the oven, you know, has a firmware issue. Maybe there's something going wrong. The control loop's not um, correctly controlling the temperature, which could explain why it sometimes pegs, you know, goes too high and people get burning, it would also explain how it doesn't go to the right temperature. Um, but to do that, we're gonna have to figure out how this thing works, and more importantly, I wanna figure out what the actual temperature is, you know, being read on the oven, because it's not enough to just check the sensors working. I suspect it's firmware, so I need to understand what it's doing. Um, so this oven is not a super new model. Uh, this was, you know, it's not an IoT oven, this is an IoT hacking. Uh, this oven has a control board on the back, and this control board, you know, I have one here, um, looks something like this, so they're not huge. Uh, and you can see the date codes on, it's like 2012. Um, so again, we're, we're talking a uh, moderately old oven. But even this thing does have a microcontroller, and this microcontroller is running firmware. The firmware is measuring the temperature, deciding to turn the heating element on or off. Um, so that's kind of how these things work. So you have the high voltage relays that control your elements. Right, the microcontrollers making the decisions, and you have some sensor inputs here. Um, and this connects to display, which is another board not shown. All right, so if you look at the oven, you look at that device, um, it has this microcontroller inside it. It's a little 16-bit microcontroller. Inside that microcontroller, there's a um, bootloader, right? So the bootloader is what actually allows us to potentially reprogram the device. So this is what the manufacturers would use when they loaded it, um, and there's a little, here, there's a little, uh, you know, plug that they were used for manufacturing to load this thing. So, so that's kind of what they did. Um, this is pretty standard. The bootloader has security because they didn't want people to be able to clone them, I guess, or in my case, read out, do what I needed to do. Um, and so this is now the hardware hacking part of this, is basically I needed a way to get uh, dumps of the memory so I could figure out what was going on with the temperature sensor inside it. Um, when you look at the data sheet, 
It has this RAM transfer. Um, so we, there's really a couple things we care about. One thing is being able to get data and code out of it. You can't directly do that. They have a second stage bootloader you have to load. Um, so you need to find or write a second stage bootloader. And then you use this RAM transfer command to load that into the device. The device executes it and gives you the ability to read out memory or write memory, whatever you need to do. Um, the two problems with it are, one, there's this protection applied bit. So you basically have like a fuse bit you can set that says, you know, you can't do anything, sorry. Um, and so that was enabled on this device, so it would block there. If that wasn't enabled, there's a second check, which is a password. And so the idea is the manufacturer can decide, do they just want to password protect this, um, or do they want to totally prevent anyone from ever having the chance to, to access it? So in this case, they were using both of them. Um, so there's a password, and then presumably as the final stage um, before it ships out, they enable this protection. Um, so I need to defeat both of these types of things. With that, I also said, well, you know, that's interesting, but I want to learn about this device. I need something where it's only setting a password. Um, and so there's also a command, in a few of the commands, there's this flash memory protect set. So this turns on, would normally turn on the, the extra protection. As part of that, it also checks the password, um, presumably to prevent this from happening by accident. Um, so you have this password check there in one command, and we have another command that also has this protection bit. So we have two different levels um, of commands that we can experiment with to try to, to, try to recover this thing. Um, so that basically means we have a few problems to solve. Um, we need to figure out our second stage bootloader. Um, and then we have two different security features we need to, to bypass, the protection flag and the password. Um, and we'll have to bypass both of them to get anywhere. Um, so the first one, the question of that second stage bootloader and actually how I'm going to work with this thing um, was basically find an old dev kit. Uh, on this case, found one on eBay. Um, the, that dev kit has a nice uh, IDE with a simulator, emulator, stuff like that. Um, and so this would let me see, for example, uh, what if, if I was able to get the code out, um, I could use this to disassemble it, or it would generate the disassembly. And more importantly, it would have a reassembler. So if I want to change the code, I can convert it back um, to binary to write it in. Uh, or if I want to simulate what the program's doing, it even had a nice simulator that I could run. So this was a pretty good, pretty good find. Um, it also had that second stage bootloader I mentioned. Um, so this was only ran on Windows XP. You know, this is the vintage we're talking here. Uh, so I made a Python version of that, so you don't need Windows XP. Um, and you might want that because if you wanted to reflash your oven, uh, this software would let you do it. So you know, it's not just for working with the chip itself, um, working with the chip in systems. All right, so with that, I could get the bootloader. Um, and with the bootloader, I could take a look at how they did these two protection items, because that's what we want to bypass. So the first one is there's a function that checks the password, because this is used in both of those commands. And the important thing here is that there's basically a point in time where it sets a flag that says, hey, the password was wrong. This was a failure. So if it sets the flag that says the password was wrong, um, then that means you know, that's it. It's, it's no longer going to do the next stages. Um, this is interesting, though, because there's kind of the instruction flow depends on if the password was right or wrong, which is very common. Uh, but there's a way that we can monitor that instruction flow uh, and we can actually see, you know, was the password right or wrong one byte at a time. So the trick here, it loads a byte, right, and then compares it with the known good byte, which means that we have the chance to, you know, rather than have to guess the whole password, we can guess one byte of the password, figure out that one, use that to guess the next byte, et cetera, right? So rather than guessing um, the 256, you know, to the power of 12, we just go uh, 256 is one guess, then 256 is another guess, then 256 is another guess. So it's a, it's a more reasonable uh, attack. Um, yeah, so that's good. The other thing we could do is look at that protection bit. So there's a protection bit that just stops it from operating. Um, and the protection bit basically has a point in time where it compares the status of the protection bit flag um, and says, is this enabled or not? And if it's not enabled, it jumps to some error. So what we want to do is we're going to want to delete this function more or less, ideally. All right, so 
what did we learn? We learned the password check has this code flow that depends on if the password's right or wrong, and it depends on it one byte at a time. Um, and we learned that the fuse byte check has a location that if we could remove that code, um, we could bypass it. And this, this type of, of logic is a good area to insert a fault um, with fault injection. Um, all right, so what we're gonna start with is easy difficulty to try to exploit these two. And it doesn't get that much more difficult, but by easy difficulty, I mean I'm not using the oven board. I made a little target board here with this chip. This chip is obsolete. I found a bunch on eBay so I could make some of these boards. Um, it's not the exact same as on the oven, but same family, so we expect it to be quite similar. Has the same bootloader. Um, this board will let me do power analysis and fault injection, so it uses this chip whisper thing I talked about that I started a while ago. Um, and this uses a newer version called Chip Whisper Husky, but this can do glitching, power analysis, voltage glitching, um, and I'll talk about electromagnetic fault injection later. But we can basically do all the attack we need with this, uh, with this type of tool. So, and, and you can do this with other ways, so you can use an oscilloscope for power analysis. Um, there's other tools to do fault injection. You know, there, there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, this was just a convenient way for me. So with power analysis, we basically take advantage of the fact that um, the devices, the power the device used depends on what the device is doing, right? So when we looked at this password, we see, all, we see different instructions, right? Like there's a compare, or sorry, um, erase. Compare here, right? There's jumps, there's loads, um, there's returns. So there's these different instructions. And at a very fine-grained um, way, they actually take slightly different amounts of power. Uh, so what we do is, we take our microcontroller running that bootloader. Um, in my case, I inserted a resistive shunt, and basically this is gonna develop a voltage that varies with um, current. So the current is what's changing as the device is doing different operations. Um, and then I measure this inside the chip whisper uh, using this analog uh, amplifier and analog to digital converter. Um, the important part here is that you, the, the samples are actually aligned with the clock of the device which means that I know directly, you know, on this instruction or on instruction one, it was this, on instruction two, it was this. Um, so we have very good alignment. We can really easily determine, you know, even though it's only one single instruction difference, uh, we can determine, you know, that that happened. Uh, you can even do more advanced attacks where you determine that the data being processed was different. Um, so this is kind of the idea of power analysis, is we, we take very fine-grained power measurements and we use that to, you know, recover secrets from the device. So as an idea, let me uh, zoom in a bit. Right, so at the bottom here, we have the clock cycle. So this is like from the device, and I'm trying to kind of hide some of the jitter right now. That's why I zoomed in weirdly. Um, and, and what this is is the power usage of the device. Oops, I don't know. There we go. Uh, the power usage of the device as I send different uh, password guesses to it. So only it sent four different guesses of one byte of the password, but it compares one byte at a time, so that's all we need. So you can see at the start here, there's these, these four different colors, and they're all perfectly overlapped, or you know, more or less perfectly overlapped. Um, and as we go on in time, you know, that, that overlap continues until we get to about here. And this green trace, so it's, it, it's a bit hard to see that there's you know, so many different ones. This green trace actually differs from the other four power traces, which are all overlapping. So what this tells us is whatever we sent when we get the green trace out of it, was actually a result of the device taking a different code path. And you can kind of see, you know, more explicitly here that the green trace has sort of been shifted over. And this is because it didn't set that fail bit, so it took a different amount of time because, you know, it, it didn't execute one of the instructions the other code path executed. So in this case, that first byte of the password is S. So now what I could do is I send S that I discovered, and then I iterate through all possibilities for the second byte, recover the second byte, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so that should work to recover the password. And I could kind of make this a little more obvious because what I do is I take an average of all 256 values for the first byte, and then just compare that, um, the average of those 256 to each guess. And, and you'll get one outlier because there's basically one byte that um, you know, was the different code path, therefore the power trace looks different, and so we see this really obviously, and we just you know, look up what that was, whatever that was in ASCII, in this case was S. All right, so that gives us the password. We still need to bypass the protection bit, 
Um, so to do that, we use fault injection. Uh, and the idea of fault injection is that we want that device not to execute the jump, for example. Right? So we have this jump that we want to delete. So how do we delete this? Um, we take advantage of the fact that when this microcontroller is executing devices, every microcontroller, even very basic ones, um, have pipelines. And so the pipeline means that on a single clock cycle, you're not just doing one thing, you're doing multiple things. Um, so for example, to run a program, we fetch an instruction from memory, so reading it out of flash or ROM, wherever it's stored. Um, at the same time as we're fetching one, we're decoding the previous instruction, right? Because the decode logic is separate from the fetch, so they don't have to wait on each other if we kind of have this pipeline that's always you know, a few steps behind uh, on the fetch compared to the decode and execute. And finally, we can try to execute you know, at the same time as we're decoding the previous instruction and loading you know, n minus two instruction. So, so we basically have this pipeline. Um, and how this pipeline gets implemented is important because you know, all these instructions are moving through the pipeline. And the pipeline itself uses a bunch of registers, which are effectively flip-flops. So for example, this could be like the register that the instruction fetch got loaded into. And then we have another register, which is, for example, the instruction decode. Um, and so the way flip-flops work is you have, a, you have a common clock because you really want the clock to uh, arrive at the flip-flops at the same time. So it's routed on typically this low skew network. Uh, and in between the clocks, you have to do something with the data. So we have this logic, and this logic is pretty slow. This kind of defines your maximum clock speed because basically the data has to go from this flip-flop right, to the input of the next flip-flop um, in some amount of time, and that amount of time has to be lar or smaller than when you see the, the two clock inputs. So a normal clock looks like this, right? Say it's 100 megahertz, then we have a time here of 10 nanoseconds. So all it means is the data going through from state to state um, has to get there faster than 10 nanoseconds. And there's some additional requirements right around this, but the basic idea is that, is that we have a path, we've got to get the data through that path. Um, if it's not ready in time, right, so it, if this clock was too fast, then the data is going to be, you know, not finished processing, and so invalid data gets loaded. Um, and this is what we do with clock glitching, is we exploit that, we basically purposely insert, so here we have this, this extra clock edge, and it's too soon, right? So it, it's in between the normal time. Um, and the idea is we can move this clock edge around, because if you imagine our system, it's got a lot of different logic paths. They all have different amounts of logic. They take different times to go through. Um, so we can kind of play around with this time and actually the width of it. And so there's a few things we kind of experiment with to try to get what we call a fault, which means that, for example, um, when the, the execute happens, we insert another uh, clock edge right before that. And maybe it doesn't have time to actually load the instruction into execute. And it just re-executes the previous instruction. Um, or maybe it executes or decodes a no-op or something. We don't know exactly um, because a few different things will look the same, right? So you could imagine here if this compare instruction wasn't executed. And by chance, the, the flags were already set such that it looks like the password was OK, which could happen depending on whatever instructions were being executed before. Um, it wouldn't take the jump. Likewise, if we didn't take the jump, if we kind of caused this to get corrupted, it also would look like it accepted our password. So there's a few different ways that, um, that this can work, or not password, sorry, accepted the, the protection bit being set. Um, there's a few different ways this could work. But the, the end goal is that we do something, we try to make the device you know, perform incorrectly, which means it's not going to um, check the protection bit, which means we can send the password and then send the bootloader and then read stuff out. All right, great. Um, that's great in theory. How do we do this in practice? So this bootloader also has a function that does a checksum of flash. So it basically sums up the value of flash and tells you what that is. Um, the point of this is that this is a really nice function because we can use this to try to calibrate our glitch. So um, we use this to calibrate our glitch because I just keep asking the device to do a checksum of memory. And at the same point, I insert glitches while changing the, the offset and width and stuff like that. So, um, and that works quite well, and you end up with a, so this is just some Python code that runs that, for example. Um, and you end up with a graph like this that is like, hey, here's um, clock glitch settings. 
right? And so we have different settings, and all of these little green pluses are basically a specific offset and width that caused the checksum to be incorrect, but the device didn't crash, the device continued to operate, the rest of the device worked properly. It only corrupted that one checksum. Um, so once we know those, we hopefully can use that to bypass our, our fuse uh, read, because what we're gonna have to do next is figure out where in time you know, this is happening. We don't know that yet either. So that's one of the things we've got to do on the real device, not just, you know, just do that little demo. Um, so the final thing I did is basically take my known good values and sweep it across trying to send the bootloader. This is all on my little test board, right? So I'm, I'm not looking at the real oven board yet, just my test board. Um, and eventually you, you, you find the device and it responds with, um, instead of, you know, the error, it responds with hex 10 which if you look at the bootloader protocol means, you know, oop, no protection enabled, please send password. And then I found the password with power analysis and send that. All right, cool. So, yeah, at this point we have a Python class for communicating and programming, we have timing, and we have rough timing details on fault injection. Um, we're gonna go up a level in difficulty now to medium, uh, and it doesn't go any higher. In this case, because the, the board, it turns out that the oven board is really good for doing this type of stuff. It's like a, like a fun capture the flag S target. Um, because this board, it's, it's kind of one layer done with wave soldering. It has these wire jumpers on it, uh, which is you know, common for this sort of low cost device. And it turns out one of those wire jumpers is actually only power to the microcontroller and there's no capacitors. So you can do this kind of you know, very bodgy looking resistor to do that same power analysis on the target board. Um, and you also, oh no, go away, um, have a crystal here that you can desolder and um, put your clock glitches in there. So, so I mean, it's like really, really kind of textbook example of, of how this could work. Um, so yeah, so I set that up and that would be the goal of how we're doing power analysis. Um, so we already knew from the bootloader testing I did how this should work, and we basically adjust this to send known part of the password, then attack the next unknown byte in a loop. So it's gonna iteratively, it finds one byte, uses that to attack the next one, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, the output looks like this. This is obviously just PowerPoint, but same idea in Jupyter. Um, and, and the password turns out to be something you probably could have just guessed, but if you didn't do all the power analysis, you might have tried this password. But I didn't try that password. Um, the second part of it is then I take that fault injection script and try to apply it to the real board. And remember the timing's gonna vary a bit because it's a, you know, a slightly different device on a different board. Um, so it goes through and eventually I get 10 hex and I'm super happy because it worked. And now I can read out the firmware and finish this talk. Um, unfortunately when I would go to read the firmware I got all FF, so this is just FF in ASCII. Um, and then when I, you know, that's weird, what's going on? When I check, it says it's not protected. So what actually happened is the bootloader also has other commands, including erase flash, and when you erase flash, it unlocks the protection. Um, so as part of my glitching, I glitched it, you know, into a mode that erased the flash, which is not the best. Um, but you're super excited because you're like so close. So you go to a part store nearby and you get a, a replacement board, you know, the first board I bought off eBay, I looked up what board should be in my oven and just got that, so I didn't have to break the oven. Um, I still don't want to break the oven, so I'm like, okay, I'll get the right board. Um, it turns out, so when protection's enabled, there's no way to read out the flash, according to the, manu the, the chip manufacturer. Um, so this means that Samsung couldn't actually check. If they, had, if they had returns, they can't check what happened. Did the flash get corrupted? Don't know. Um, I suspect they had issues with that, and maybe this is actually related to the, the first thing, right, about all of these, uh, these other people complaining, because this board didn't have the read, the, the fuse bit set at all. It still had the password, but it didn't have the fuse bit. So this meant that that really cool attack I showed you with the fault injection, um, it turns out on newer boards you only need the password. So it was cool, but it wasn't, act I just had to get a new board, which I had to get anyway, and I wouldn't have needed to do that. All right, um, but now we had the code, so that's great. So now we can actually take a look at the code. Um, as a quick note too, another way to do it, um, you can use 
Uh, you know, I use clock glitching. There's other ways of doing glitching. So another open source tool I made, so you can build this for like 50 bucks. And I had a few of these uh, kits around. Um, chip shared Pico EMP, so it uses Raspberry Pi Pico to generate high voltages and dump um, pulses into the chip. And this is open source. There's been some remixes of it already, so you, so you might see similar looking things around. Um, you know, and you can drive the thing from a Raspberry Pi Pico. So it's a very, this, this whole thing is very accessible with different ways to do it. Um, all right, so now we have the code, standard reverse engineering stuff. You know, I don't know, people like different things here, Ida, Ghidra, Binary Ninja. Um, use whatever you want. Uh, but if you're at you know, the talk, the really great keynote that Maria gave about AI reverse engineering tools, because that's something that could make our life easier, I thought, you know what, that's true. We should use some really good AI tools. And the best one I know is going to be Excel. Uh, and so, and actually, I had a great disassembler. The problem was the disassembler was awesome because it's from the manufacturer. Uh, and so I just loaded that as a CSV into Excel. And it works really well. You can like find all locations where it has a load byte of a certain value. Um, highly recommend it. Anyway, uh, with this, there's a serial monitor built in, I discovered. So there's a serial monitor that can be used for checking status bytes. Um, it's not documented in the service docs that I could find. So the other thing is this could be a useful tool right, for repair techs, because you can tell if certain things are enabled or disabled. Um, it doesn't let you just dump memory, so it's a very, very basic serial monitor. So I could patch it basically to make a simple memory dump monitor. Um, yeah, which is what was being done in Excel as well. So you patch it, make a memory monitor, put this into my real oven so I can finally do that. Um, and then I, I discovered that when I bought the board off eBay, I kind of just quickly Googled what the part number of the board should be in my oven, and I messed that up. And, and actually, I put in like F when it should be D. Um, and they look physically the same, but it's different firmware. And the F one has an induction stovetop or something. So it just gave me this E84, and it wouldn't work. So this was like 8 PM at night. But you know, I still have my good board from my oven. And I said, uh, you know, I'm too excited. I'm just going to take the oven PCB, and I'm going to read out from that. Because that one is good, and I have a pretty good attack that's going to work. Um, you know, and it, it's 8 PM at night. There was probably some plans to cook some stuff. Uh, and anyway, then it turns out that I also slightly glitched that wrong, and it came out with FFs and erased itself. Um, yeah, so that wasn't an impress your spouse moment of your hardware attacks. So in the morning, when the parts store is open, you go get a new oven board. Um, and the new oven board is the right one. It also doesn't have protection enabled, and you can read this out correctly. Um, and, and part of the reason this happened in the end, I realized, is that I sweep my glitch from kind of the beginning of time to end. The beginning is where it's decoding the command, um, and that makes it more likely to trigger the erase. So if you go the other way, it's is smarter. Um, and you don't erase both your oven boards that way. But yeah, so then you can reprogram it and recover your oven. Um, so this is just reprogramming the known good firmware in, right? So, and I was also testing. This other question that, you know, for repair, can you actually just reflash some of these boards? Um, and basically, yes is the answer. Um, so now we're just at the stage where we have a functional board. Uh, my firmware's changed from what it was before, right? My oven reboots and um, works normally. So we still haven't fixed anything. We've just unbroken things. All right, the, the other thing, too, that was interesting was between, you know, even though I couldn't access the, uh, the firmware fully in my old one, I could get the, the checksum. I did that before I erased it. And the checksums differ between the new board. Um, and they kind of have this revision number that's like the, the style of the board, not the firmware revision. Um, so there could have been firmware updates, right? There's no updates you can apply to this thing. There's no manufacturing updates. Um, for repair of this, the update process is buy a new board and throw away your old one. Um, so one of the you know, points of this talk is around kind of e-waste repair stuff. Uh, that these sort of techniques are really valuable because they're helping repair techs actually fix things and not just replace the boards. Anyway, so now what I do is take my board with the known good firmware. Um, this one is different. It doesn't have that serial monitor I mentioned, so I had to add in a new serial monitor code. The downside of that is I kind of overwrote some memory. This is going to come up later because um, I didn't know exactly what it's doing. Right? I'm kind of reverse engineering what I can. And we add this, and we now have the ability to see variables. So as the board's running, I can request memory space. 
Um, and with a bit of experimentation, you basically figure out, okay, at this address is the temperature that the, the oven is reading. Right here is a flag that is used to turn the heater on. So I can see, for example, this pattern of pulses is the heating element and how it's running. Um, what you'll see in a second on the next slide is you'll notice like at the beginning it's on constantly and then it does this, these little pulses. Um, and, and the reason this happens is basically if you, if you have an oven like this, you'll recognize some of this stuff. Um, you turn it on, uh, and so in Canada we use Fahrenheit for oven temperature as well, even though we use Celsius for other stuff, so this is all Fahrenheit. Um, you turn it on, right, and the oven heats up, and as soon as it reaches the set temp, in this case 375, uh, it goes into sort of a maintain mode. So it starts in a preheat mode. In preheat mode, it shows you the actual temperature. So the kind of maddening thing, if you have one of these, is that as you turn it on, it, it, it's, you know, it's saying, ooh, I'm heating up, don't worry, like I'm 150, 151, 150, et cetera. So it actually shows you a nice heat up curve. As soon as it reaches 375, it beeps and only displays 375. Um, and you know, this is now kind of guessing, but the, the assumption here is because it peaks like this, they want to sort of hide that peak from the user because that doesn't look great. Um, and they also hide the fact that it could drop out after. So this temperature is what you see, um, and it, it is actually set to 375, so there's, if you have this oven, you also might say, ooh, well, there's a convection mode that drops the temperature a bit, so that's disabled here. Um, so it should be running at 375. And, and what you actually see is that it drops down, and it's, it's doing lots of pulses. So each of these little flags down, uh, when it turns on the heating element, the, there's an error that gets added to the temperature that you see as this spike going down, um, just due to some electronic noise and, and shifting of a reference. So nothing important. The important thing is there's just this small spike that you can kind of see where the heating elements are on. Um, and you can see it's already kind of low, and it's starting to maybe it's going to heat back up. Um, but as soon as I open the oven right here and put in a shepherd's pie, which is a moderate you know, amount of stuff that's going to give it a bit of a, like heat that it has to heat up now, it, it just drops and it never recovers, right? So for the rest of the time here, it, it basically doesn't even look like it's ever going to recover at all. And I think there might be once or twice I open it as those other little dips. Um, so this is the turkey problem I had, is that it would drop down, and especially in a big load like a big turkey, and then it, it's not running um, enough power through, through the element or it's not on long enough to heat. So the original assumption I had is there was some control loop and the control loop was tuned poorly. Um, here it's kind of like a timed pulse control loop. So if it's under temp, it just sends fixed amounts of, of controlled pulses um, and it doesn't actually adjust the width of those pulses, which is what you might expect. So that's what I wanted to fix. Um, I also patched, so the first thing I did when you're reverse engineering it, you can kind of figure out where this, this logic is happening. Um, so I patched the display logic. So what you see here is, right, it's displaying a temperature of 98 Fahrenheit, which it normally doesn't display anything that low during the preheat. Um, and it's also patched so it continuously shows you the temperature, if it's going up or down or anything like that. Um, I also patched the cooking logic, so it works more like an old school thermostat. So it, it, it varies a little more, but it actually gets up back up to temperature. Um, so what that looks like once I've sort of patched my firmware, reflashed the oven, is this. Um, so the same test, here's where I open the thing to put it in. Um, and what you can see is that it's, it's recovering much faster because these pulses are much wider. Um, it's also, you know, bouncing around maybe a little more um, is the only question. So does that matter? Uh, it, this looks like the kind of, you know, temperature from an old manual or, you know, mechanical thermostat oven. Um, so it should be fine. But the test for this is a souffle and baking shows. They always seem to cook a souffle to see if their oven is, is out of temp. Um, I didn't really, you know, I've made cookies before. I haven't done a souffle. This is more complex. And I don't have a souffle pan um, or a souffle, whatever you call this, cup thing. Um, I do have Tupperware. And it turns out that probably, I think, would work. So as a test, I decided to test a souffle cook. Um, and I put the shelf on the wrong height here, so the video is longer than needed. But we're going to cook the souffle to see if, in fact, you know, if that variation is fine, which it should be. Um, this should rise a little bit, and, and will indicate that I'm going to call this a success. So that was kind of the final validation I did um, to cook this. So you put it in, and actually, when I go back, so you'll see here, right, the temperature is bouncing around again. This is the patch logic. You don't get that on the normal oven. It just would always show you a fixed temperature. 
Um, and the result, it tasted pretty good, and it did rise a bit. So if you want to try it, there's a recipe down there. Um, and you can use, like, just use Tupperware. It's, it's, it's actually pretty easy. If you have a mixer, I recommend it. Um, so the, the one thing I mentioned earlier is I kind of overwrote some memory. Um, there's a couple bugs that are still being fixed. Um, the main one is that sometimes the oven stops heating entirely. Um, so the first time this happened, I was away. And you just have to power cycle it at the breaker, and then it's fine for a while again. And you might think this is terrible, but I mean, this is very, like, if you know the Patriot missile system history, it had a similar bug. All right, so if the US military requires you to power cycle things, it's fine. Um, but if, if you remove the serial code, this should actually go away because this is me patching out a bunch of memory. All right, so future work. Um, there's another control board. So I'm sorry if you're really excited and you go to look up and you have this board. Um, my parents have a similar oven, similar problems. It uses a newer control board. Um, luckily, it also, you can basically attach a debugger to it um, and read it out. It's different architecture and stuff, so the memory addressing will be, the space will be different and need to also figure out where the uh, control logic is. Um, it's supported in Ghidra, so you don't have to excel it up if you want to do this, and this is something that's kind of ongoing. So hopefully there's also some patches for this oven as well. But because I don't have the oven, it's slower because I can't uh, do as much live testing. Um, if you do this yourself, just kind of a matricy of danger. Um, the display temperature mods are pretty safe. Uh, the serial interface, you know, except for the random RAM parts, a little sketchy. Um, the heating algorithm, what I don't know is, you know, maybe they made those pulses really narrow because if you keep it on for a long time, it'll catch fire. Um, right, so I, I don't actually know that if there's a reason they did that. Um, I also don't do super long baking in the oven, so maybe that's fine. Uh, just remember, though, that the knobs on the top control the ranges. The heating element is 100% firmware controlled. So if your oven decides to turn on at 3 a.m. because you have a, a memory overflow, it's going to turn on at 3 a.m. Um, you know, those relays just control the heating elements in the oven fully. So that's kind of why this danger matrix looks like that. All right, so really the, the, the point of this, right, it, it might not be your fault, A, if you have one of these and you've been going crazy. Um, is because the oven sort of lies to you about the temperature setting uh, and what it's actually doing. Um, the other big thing, and kind of why I really you know, did all this work, not just to repair my oven, is the amount of waste generated by this. So if you look online, there's people that you know, are subbing out boards, elements, and they're not working, sub subbing out um, temperature sensors. And part of that is that the tools for repairing it aren't that great. Um, there's no information on reflashing. So all that stuff about reflashing um, is 0% you know, documented. Uh, from the oven manufacturer, even though there's a nice connector on the board and you can just use an opto-isolated thing and it works, like it, it's really easy to do, right? That's something that's, that's very trivial. If you don't have to do all of the crazy attacks, now that you have the password, you don't have to do that. Um, so just reflashing the, the board should be a repair item, but really it isn't. Um, yeah, and with that, I will, I think we might be out of time for questions. Um, all the information, though, is in the, these Git repos, which are also linked from my blog post, so if you don't want to remember the big URL, they're linked from there, um, including how you know, some of those patched instruction locations and things like that, so you actually could experiment with your, this yourself. Um, yeah, and then also I will be going to the bookstore for a little book signing right after this. So thanks very much.